Through our journey and through the documentary of Mallory's Army, what I really wanted to do was continue this voice and continue to showcase other people's stories. Because I think that one of the biggest obstacles that we have is that people feel sorry for you for a few months. You know, they, they feel sorry, but then they expect you to move on. And what they don't understand is that you never move on. So I wanted to use my life to showcase other people's stories and the things that happen to them, but also what they're doing. They're, they're taking on challenges that I didn't know needed to be taken on. And now that I'm living it, I go, oh, now, now I can get it. Well, I wish that I could live this life with Mallory here because this is my best life. So my favorite question to ask is always, when people ask me, my truly favorite question is when they say, tell me about Mallory. So I'm gonna start with my favorite question is, tell me about your brother. Uh, Jonathan, our first memory of him was how my parents met, uh, how Nick and my mom met at the Cornwall Park. He was my sister and I, I was seven, they were three or four and uh, we were on a black bouncy bridge. Michelle and I were playing and um, Jonathan was throwing rocks at us. And so my mom, so Nick came over and was like, oh my God, I'm so sorry. And like, maybe he even planned it because he was like, oh, hot chick, two kids, single, obviously. Um, Let's see where that's all about. So that's how they met was Jonathan throwing rocks at us. And that was, I think for those guys, was like love at first sight. And for us, we came from two different places, but we instantly became family um, to some degree. And that didn't come without any trials or tribulations along the way. He and I bonded together because I had a little brother now, which was cool and um, Michelle was probably the typical little sister trying to keep up in the mix, you know, with the two boys that were going to do their thing. Um, but we always, uh, we always stuck together when it counted, for sure. Uh, it was just his birthday on June 28th. Jonathan loved music, and every year on his birthday, my stepfather and I try and play um, guitar together somewhere live in a park. Um, this year we played at a little burger joint on Long Beach Island called Woody's and uh, I was I didn't want to play at first because I was like oh no one's gonna want to hear me play and and I wasn't in the right mindset and uh, but then I got there and he was already playing and I had my guitar I had my music I had everything was with me and I think it's still a hurdle it wasn't just playing guitar I think it's still a hurdle saying that he's not here and uh but then at the same time um getting up and playing is part of the continued recovery process of him not being there and a moment for my stepfather and i to share that bond um together and to pay tribute um uh, because he although was a very troubled person um, he was a really cool kid and, uh, and those are the memories that I have of him. My stepfather always played in bands. Like that was one of our family activities was wherever he was gigging in a band, weddings, parties, barbecues, uh, out at bars, things like that. Like we were out supporting, carrying equipment, watching. That was his outlet, like for what he was going through in life with his separation, with the child, trying to figure out how to be a dad to a very strong-willed child. And uh, when you don't have any help or support from another parent um, and it's all on you, that's not easy. And I respect him for what he did and the effort that he gave in trying to be a really good dad to Jonathan. And Nick, he's a great man and he's a great dad. He just had to figure out how he was gonna do that. And his way was doing things that he was familiar with um, in that regard. And so music always stuck out. I didn't learn. I didn't learn from him about music, like how to play. I play guitar now with him, but he always made sure that that was present in our lives, even just to enjoy it. And Jonathan really picked up on it. He was super big into Kurt Cobain, Nirvana, grunge era. While that music was revolutionizing the world, it was also empowering young teens to rebel 
against some things that might not look great at that time, but might have provided some structure and stability in their lives. And to say fuck it and to run in the opposite direction while fun can also lead you down a path um, that's really hard to claw your way back out of. And um, Jonathan recorded a lot in my stepfather's studio. And there's photos of him, which is interesting because you're asking me about us as children. And the photo that pops up is us on my grandpa's dock. Holding up these two little fish that we caught. And then I kind of fast forward as I tell you this story to a photo of him playing guitar. And he's got like black, uh, black and around his eyes, really long hair, very grungy, very tired looking. And uh, you wonder what happened from catching that fish to keeling over that guitar in a, in a fit of rage and hopelessness uh, and, and what could have been done differently to help recover from that. So he didn't like structure and he didn't like rules and he didn't like to be told what to do. It had to be on his time and he wanted to dictate what was happening. Um, in his life, which is admirable, and, uh, and that shows a very distinct quality trait in someone um, of strength and willingness. And unfortunately, when that mixture of willingness is pointed in the direction of not having hope and being willing to end your own existence, that's a real bad combination. <laughs> It's not easy to pull that trigger, so to speak. And yet he was still able to do it. And uh, he was very determined. Uh, I just wish that he wasn't as determined on that day, if ever a day. So tell me what happened. Tell me how old he was. Tell me, tell me what happened. Take me on that journey. Share with me if you don't mind. So uh, Jonathan was not living in the house, but living at home in the woods in a tent. And, um, and that was good um, because he had traveled around a little bit and he had a very rebellious spirit and he had a hard time dealing with structure, um, which is where he and my mom butt heads a little bit and her as stepmom mm -hmm. um, was tough because you know we were raised very strict um, with my mother. And so that always didn't blend well with him. So I think a combination of wanting to move away from that structure and his own rebellious spirit put him in some of the positions that he was in um, with uh, drug use and separating himself from the family unit. Um, and when he was living with his girlfriend in the tent um, outside of the house, that was a good thing because at least he was still there and the doors were unlocked and he knew that he could always come in. And so that was a positive um, for us. So at the end, I think he just hit a point that was not recoverable for him. He made the choice to take his own life. So it was him and another kid. They were in a motel in Newburgh and uh, they agreed that they were both going to consume enough oxy to kill themselves and the one kid bailed out at the last minute and Jonathan had consumed and passed. So that was it. I was driving, it was Christmas time, a couple weeks before Christmas. And I remember getting a phone call from my mom saying that he overdosed in a hotel with another kid. They had written letters. They both committed to overdosing on Oxycontin and the other kid backed out at the last minute and Jonathan didn't. And I turned around, I went to the house, and Nick's house and Nick was in the recording studio where Jonathan's mat had a mattress there. He was sleeping in the woods, but he did have a bed inside. And Nick was keeled over the bed, crying, sobbing uncontrollably. And I just stood there watching like, what the fuck? And uh, Nick hugged me. He saw me, I went up to him and just like tapped on him. And then he hugged me 
and I knew that he wasn't hugging me, he was picturing hugging John. After he passed, the funeral came. I couldn't go to the funeral. I had, I had food poisoning and maybe something else wasn't having me be there. Um, but my stepfather played uh, Nirvana, Come As You Are, at the funeral um, for him. And in his passing, that was a powerful moment to me for, I'm a parent now, but seeing as a parent, him saying like, we accepted you as you are. Mm -hmm. I think even spiritually, he was saying like, God is also telling you, come as you are, to hear like you, you're okay. You're gonna be okay here. So I think that now, Nick and I connect over music. Uh, I was gifted this Washburn folk body style guitar, walnut face, and it was Jonathan's guitar. And he's always trying to get it back. Nick is, but I won't give it up. <laughs> it just sounds so good, and, uh, and I know where it's been. So now he and I share that bond of music, and um, it's almost like we continue that family tradition, um, knowing that John is still a part of that. I don't think my sister and I really ever talked about what happened, and I never addressed what happened until I became an adult, and it started becoming relevant in my life as to why I needed to address that. Mm -hmm. and, um, and I think that that event became one of the tools in my life that prepared me to take on the project that I'm taking on now for Play For Your Freedom. Mm -hmm. With the project that we're working on, I can't directly connect with the veteran community because I did not serve, but they're going through something very devastating where they're losing a lot of their members of the community by their own hand through lack of hope, through lack of self-worth. And I think Jonathan had that same mentality that he didn't respect himself if he did see how valuable he really was, he might not have made that choice. And the same thing with these men and women that we're trying to help in these projects. So a fellow, a, a veteran will not expect me to relate to them as soldiers, but when I share that I lost my brother and that we need to find a way to give people hope and purpose, they can connect with me on that and together we can help resolve some of the issue that's going on in that community and our community in general. Um, there's no excuse for someone to not find something to live for, and it just takes a little bit of time to figure out what that is. And I keep on stressing, like, a lot can happen in a day. Like, give me another day, and let's see what we can, see what we can do. And the things that people can survive and, and come out on the other side of is incredible. Um, but they need the support to know that they're doing a really good job. And time sometimes is, is really all you can give someone. Time, support, encouragement, um, strategies, all that. But in time, you don't forget, but you learn how to live with it. And that goes for any illness or any one's illness or any loss, right? It's with you, it's a part of you, it's part of your story, it's part of who you are. But it, nine times out of 10, from the survivors and the people I'm sure you've come in contact with and the people I've come to contact with. It's made them all the more awesome. I haven't fully figured out the impact of what Jonathan has had on me, but now I'm starting to understand it and respect it a little bit more with the hopes that another parent won't have to bury their kid. Um, tell me, is, is the statistic true that 22 veterans a day commit suicide? Is that, is that an accurate statement? No. Okay. It's probably more. Wow. So there's certain cases where um, you might have a veteran who is out of the military and in a transition process and might have a substance use issue mm -hmm. and that veteran may consume and overdose even though it wasn't an act of suicide. It, there were still issues going on, and that's how that person was self-medicating, even though the intention wasn't there. I think statistics like that don't tell us how many of our service members, I'm gonna say, we're losing. Right. 
So I'm not going to use the term suicide on, on every, and I'm going to say that we're losing people who are making unhealthy choices for themselves because of where they're at and the lack of help that they're getting. So I think that that statistic is true, yes, but I think that you think it's there's greater. a greater number of people that are being lost um, in so that space. So how long ago did you lose Jonathan? When, when did he pass 2005. away? 2005. 2005, okay. So Jonathan wasn't a service member. He wasn't part of the... So take me on the steps that brought you to to honor our veterans in your brother's honor. Like I'd like to learn how you how you decided that you even because a lot of times people will choose a foundation or an organization because that was their mission. You have taken on not only to heal your brother's death, um, and and was was Jonathan an addict or was he experimental or did he just make the decision to use oxy to end his life? Um. I know that he used some other drugs. I know that you know he smoked pot and stuff like that. And um, but he wasn't an, an, an. Would you consider him an addict? I don't think that okay. he was evaluated for that. I don't know. I think. I think the definition of addiction would have had to come with his recognition that something was wrong. Okay. And he was so young. Like, how do you? How old was he? He was sixteen. 15 or 16, and it's tough to call somebody a drug addict who's just in a routine of doing unhealthy things. Right, right, right. So, I don't know. Right, right. Um, also, when you're young, and those things give you that high and that feeling, it's really easy to turn in that direction versus a sober direction right. also. So, I'm um, asking because here we are in 2019, and there's so much controversy and so much com you know, conversation around um, the opioid crisis that we have, the heroin addiction. Um, I just read yesterday that New Jersey is ranked two in its production of meth. Um, and so as if it was almost like bragging rights. It's a huge problem. Right, and so I, that's why I was, I was yeah, curious so to see. Things were different, a little bit different back then, I think, and um, I don't, I don't know the the details surrounding it. I just know that it wasn't good. Right. Um, and and how old were you? I was 23. When your 16 year old brother died. Correct. So he was a baby. Um, and he's the same age as my sister, roughly. She's yeah. just uh, a year wow. older than him, I think. So he was the baby. Yeah. yeah. So he wasn't a part of my founding of Play for Your Freedom because I wasn't addressing that in my life. That was buried, and among other things. And um, I found out a friend was injured in war and he didn't look like he was hurt. So he opened up my eyes to what invisible wounds were in people, although I was walking around with them for most of my life, I didn't I realize that. it I and love that. until invisible I met him. Invisible wounds. So, we started talking. I wanted to have this football game and we played to raise some money for where he got his help from. And he explained to me some of the things that he struggled with internally as well as some of his peers in the military. So that's kind of how it started. And we had our football game and we honored him as a service member. And um, the community kind of came together to play for their freedom, to show support for their service members. Um, six years later, the name of the organization has shifted onto the shoulders of the service members that were helping, where they are now the ones encouraged to play for their own freedom within. Right. So getting them to engage in positive, healthy, physical and social activity so they can gain freedom to live a healthy and happy life. I did a talk recently where I revealed a bunch of stuff about myself that was very personal and that I never addressed or dealt with appropriately because I was asking the veterans to become vulnerable and to become a person who can comfortably say like this is wrong with me like and it's really bothering me and I need to I need help addressing it because they need to say that to themselves in order to be able to say it to somebody else and help somebody else and that's part of letting your problem go to help somebody else and I gave this talk where I almost walked off the stage and I was the last speaker of the evening and I came out and I started my introduction and I was like, what am I doing? 
do I really want the world to know like this about me? And you have all these reservations that are like flowing through and all these emotions. And I almost walked off the stage. And then I stopped for a second and I was like, if I don't do this, there could be someone else who might be lost. And not that my story would save them, but if I'm not doing everything I can to give somebody else a chance and setting aside my reservations and setting aside my problems, then what good am I doing anyway? And I'm a hypocrite because I'm asking them to do it. And that's the kind of leader I think we all need to be is uh, somebody who's willing to really lay it on the line in order to save somebody else while saving yourself <laughs> because I need to come here as much as they do. This is my therapy. You know, I say nothing against you, but I need to be here too. I'm playing in that football game today. <laughs> you know, I, I need to go run with you and, and do it in a healthy way. And I partied when I was younger and turned to drugs and alcohol and lived in that falsified reality. But when you start respecting yourself, you realize that you can overcome those bumps and the more respect you show for yourself, you can respect those around you that need that help and that need that little bit of extra boost. And, uh, and you can't do that if you don't have a strong foundation and it's never too late to start rebuilding your foundation, um, especially the people that find themselves at the rock bottom and we see a lot of them. Um, we have to just encourage them that it's okay to be where they're at right now. We have to just start laying the bricks to start moving upward. I think we all have some of this in us to help based on what we've seen and what we've heard and what we've learned and what we've studied. You learn empathy, you learn compassion, you learn how to understand what other people are going through and it makes you human, you know? And that's what we, that's what we need to go back to. So I don't think you have to be, you know, have all the training in the background to just identify if you see someone going through something to try to just be a helping hand. That's it, just, just put the hand out. If they take it, that's awesome and if they don't, they will when they're ready. When you're in these workshops, is Jonathan with you? So it's interesting you say that because he ties into this in a very difficult space. So like, we're all volunteers. I'm a carpenter, I'm just like a regular guy. Um, when we got into this, I knew, everybody knows the 22 until nine, that that statistic is there, right. but it's not real until we lost CJ. He's one of the first veterans that ever took his life, who I played football with on the same field that we operate on now. And then once he was out, he OD'd and he was gone. So that became very real. It stopped me in my tracks. I knew what I was fighting for, right. but I didn't see the devil until it walked right up to us. And mm -hmm. a woman who was mentoring me during that time was like, hey, so CJ and I exchanged bracelets. So I'll give you one of mine. Okay. Um, and he gave me his. So I said, hey man, if you ever need anything, let me know. And he's like, cool, I would love to have you wear mine. Mm -hmm. Cool. After he passed away, I thought, why didn't he call me? Why didn't I do more? Didn't I make a positive enough impression on him that he would have not chose that? Like, didn't we do enough here Maybe we're not doing enough here. Maybe I'm not doing the right thing and I shouldn't be doing this. Survivor's guilt. So now that was happening and she's like, hey, look, you can't save everybody. You have to only do the best you can to help somebody save themselves. In the first time I've been in private practice since 2002, um, I got a call, sorry, to work with a girl right after Christmas, uh, two years ago. and. She was gone by the day after Valentine's Day, and I didn't have enough time. I couldn't save her, and no one saw it coming. And I was, I was devastated. But the next day, or a couple days later, her parents came. They wanted to talk to me, so I was afraid. What were they going to say? And these people in their grief and in their loss of their teenage daughter, they said they wanted me to know it was not my fault. And they didn't want me to ever stop trying to help other people. And they trusted me with their son after that. And the father still comes here to this day. 
and I can't believe it. Um, I never thought about suicide. It never, it never entered into my mind. And, you know, you listen to Diane and, you know, what happened to my client and now I'm on the edge of my seat every single time anyone walks in the door. Because they're not going to tell me necessarily or any counselor necessarily what's, that they're going to do that. And um, so you have, you have to have it in your mind. You have to be on edge. And um, I'm, I'm willing to do that. I just wish it wasn't what we all needed to be doing right now. I wish it was different. Are people savable? Could I have could I have saved her? And this girl, you know, she was she saw a psychiatrist. They wanted to put her on medicine. She didn't want to take it, you know. But you have to you have to go at it with the opinion that the idea that everyone is savable, or else you know what I mean. You have to, but but then there are cases, and I've spoken to these parents about it, where you know kids get um, saved, you know, and then but then they just try again, and then ultimately they succeed. So how do I answer a question? Is every are there people who say I, I I don't know but you've got to try you've got to try right but but I I'm not foolish enough to think that me or any other mental health professional can you know save the world we just have to try with the best that we our ability and the the best that we can do once I realized the gravity of what was happening here I knew that we really had to work extra hard to make sure that people knew that they were welcome into a space to participate, but also welcome to live. And I can't relate directly to a military member. My dad served, my, uh, but he left when I was young, and then my great-grandfather served. So I have military in my family, my cousin yeah. Renee serves. But for them, they just look at me and I'm a regular dude, I don't understand. Right. But when I connect, connect with them and say, look, I lost one of my brothers too. Right. I know what that's like. and what we need to do is break down the barrier of we are military, we are people, you know, we are other groups that are here and approach one another on an even playing field so that we can get through this together. And so I can relate to the loss that they're incurring daily, whether it's 22 or more, right. because the true battle is restoring hope in somebody who doesn't have that anymore, mm -hmm. military or not. And um, that's where Jonathan came into play, where now I can say like, hey, he went through this. You don't have to do that. You don't have to make that choice. You know, we always say like, wait another day. I know there's people I'm talking to in that audience who are suicidal at that moment. Right. That is guaranteed. Um, and the message is a lot can happen in a day. So the pressure that I take on at a workshop is I have three hours to flick someone's switch and be like, hey, it's cool, man. It's gonna be okay. I always say that. I always say when I do the school presentations, um, I'll say to the kids, I have one hour to change your life. I was like, but it only took four minutes to change mine. I was like, you know, it took Mallory four minutes to die. So we're ahead of the game. I've got one hour to make a difference in your life. Um, but it doesn't end here. It's the journey that we take with us. So I understand that. Give me three hours because today could be yeah. a changing day in your life. It could be a defining and, moment. And I commend you for the courage it takes to stand up and do that because that's not easy. A lot of people who have gone through what you have have a hard time flicking that switch to you to look at it not as a blessing, but like you said, as now you can help yourself live and make sure somebody else doesn't have to go through that same thing. I am living my best life. Um, I'm living my best life and I think that's what love does for us. When you love someone so deeply, um, that's what it does for me. You know, being able to go out and talk to people like yourself, to see the work that you're doing, it also inspires me. I look at you and I think, okay, if he can do it, then I can do it. And then if I can do it, then that sends a message to another mom, she can do it. We don't all fight the same way. We don't all have the same battle, but we all have the unique drive to be more than what we are 
today. And that's really what it is about for me. It's, it's about, I, you know, people will say, I don't want anybody to feel the way I do, or, you know, my life is this way, so I want to make others better. Whatever that fuel is for you. For me, it's really about keeping Mallory's life and her story alive and being able to say her name. Mm -hmm. um, like I said, the greatest thing is, is tell me about Jonathan, because that is so important to say, tell me about him, where, where, let me, because that's the greatest thing that people can do for me. And so being able to do this and use my life to make an impact grassroots is so important. Yeah, and I reflected on that at when we just played guitar for him uh, on the island. And I said his name out on the microphone. It was like, hey, it's, it's my brother's birthday today. We played on his birthday. It's like, this, this place means a lot to my family, not because of the wonderful memories that are created here on the island, because they, they might be the only ones that you have mm -hmm. one day left. Yeah, yeah. You cling to those moments. You cling to those memories and you relive them. Um, it, if we truly don't have a, an idea of how long we're supposed to be here. Um, and I, I, I commend you for, for doing this for, for Jonathan. How is, your, how is your, your family? You mentioned your sister, you mentioned your mom, you mentioned your stepdad. Um, talk to me about where they are in this journey. Do they participate in mm -hmm. your um, organization? And has it been healing for them? Yes, uh, they're awesome. And it takes a village to do anything. And they have been so supportive and instrumental and eventually helping really run, like my parents sing music for the veterans at the um, events. My sister was able to just attend one and I thank her because whenever I'm at one, she's watching my son. Right. So she, I couldn't be there if she wasn't taking care of my boy. And uh, so everybody is so supportive and so into it. And we don't, we don't talk a lot about the loss, but we know that what we're doing is healing for other people. And people find out about what's happened to us and to Jonathan through some of these workshops. And we had a parent lose a child um, recently and they knew my stepfather had gone through that. So he went up to him and he was like, hey, how long does this last? Like, when's this gonna be over kind of thing? And nobody has to sit in a doctor's office in a chair, not making eye contact with somebody. When we bring people together in a peer setting, they're really looking at each other and really saying like, hey, is it gonna be okay? Because right now it doesn't feel like it's gonna be okay. And we're put in these places and we're blessed with the mindset and the, and the courage to say, yeah, it's, it is gonna be okay. Mm -hmm. you know, and it's, it's not gonna go away and the pain's not gonna go away, but we're gonna be here together and that's gonna be okay. I always say that sadness has to stay in its lane, right? You know, so what I think that we have emotions and I think of it like a, 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 a traffic, right? You've got happiness that's here, you've got joy that's here, and then you've got sadness that's here. And sometimes sadness likes to lean over and not pay attention. And there's, there's none of those beeping things on the highway that says, whoa, whoa, whoa. So you kind of have to be very mindful that sadness stays in its lane. That way you allow it to stay present. You allow it to stay with you. Because I think if we try to suppress it and say it's not allowed, it's going to surface and then it's gonna surface ugly. But if we recognize it and it stays there, like I, I say all the time, Mal, I cry every day over Mal. Um, but I know that the sadness is always there. I just make sure it stays in its lane. I, and I allow this parallel. And sometimes sadness pulls ahead and it's the dominant characteristic in my life. It's the dominant emotion. But then it also allows for the happiness moments and that way I can still allow it to stay it's with me. It's healthy. Yeah. Uh, to, and it doesn't seem like it would be, but it is healthier to exist like that. And, and yeah. healthy for you as you take this journey on like, that emotion that fuels you, I, I relate to that. And it's very important on the days where you're working really hard to flick the switch for somebody because they see the impact that something has had on you. And if you were suppressing that and saying, I'm okay, I don't need help. I am okay, I'm, I'm fine, I don't need that. They're gonna follow that same example. Right. But when you're vulnerable in front of them and say, hey, like, it's okay to cry. It's okay to admit that we're hurt. Right. We're only, 
we're at the bottom now. It's just getting stronger from here. And um, I, I try and keep that in mind that it's okay for a man to cry or okay for a woman to cry who has been hurt and who's really tough. And I'm not saying I'm a tough guy, but you know, I, I can identify with some of these men and I think it's important that they see that emotion is okay to healthy release yes. of that. And, yes. um, and that's a big, I suppressed stuff my whole life because I'm like, I don't, and out of anger, I tried to fuel mm -hmm. my progress. And anger runs out, it's a very strong emotion and um, it's not one for longevity um, or for a healthy, a healthy approach for yourself or for the people around you. And it's just part of, you're always working on your life like you're always working on your home. You know, like you gotta clean out the gutters, you gotta change out the door, you gotta watch, you know, you're always working on yourself. And as long as you're aware that you're gonna need to constantly be maintaining yourself as you change and evolve, then you can get through anything. What's interesting is that we're not professionals. Mm -hmm. um, I'm gauging the direction of our organization based off of my life experience mm -hmm. and the experience that I've kind of gained from people who have surrounded themselves with, uh, with our organization. And the, the symbolism of Jonathan living in a tent outside of the house, but the doors being unlocked is very relative to a veteran that I work with. And I'm saying a veteran, we have many, but that are at risk mm -hmm. and who are fell away from the right walk, maybe using again, maybe drinking again, isolating again. We still maintain that contact and let them know I, now they're living in the tent. Right. And they need to know daily that the door is unlocked. Right. And I'm, I know what you're doing. It's okay. Right. Like, that's okay. You know, can you give me one afternoon of not drinking? And then drink tomorrow morning, you know, if you have to do that. But can you just do one afternoon? Let's start off with that and try that. Um, so keeping um, a judgment-free space is absolutely crucial because people are so hard on themselves over things mm -hmm. that really aren't that I know. weighted. And, um, and we can get through that. So that has been one of the most instrumental and successful aspects of our organization is that no matter what we're doing, it's a judgment-free zone for these people to come in and be with one another. Um, education is huge. We're in the process of creating our own documentary right now on invisible wounds and, and what it's like, a raw story of a, of a veteran coming home and talking about what it was like to be at war and come back and what life is like now because I didn't know. I knew, but I didn't know what post-traumatic stress was and what these wounds are. I, I'm an athlete and I understood somebody who's missing an arm was gonna have a heck of a time trying to figure out how to adjust around that. But somebody who's missing something internally, it's really difficult to try and wrap your head around that until you really know what is going on and then some positive solutions to help out with that. So while our workshops will always maintain the physical fitness aspect, the peer-to-peer, -peer, judgment-free, I think we have to do more to get in front of people like me mm -hmm. and like you who aren't really directly connected or have been away, but might be able to do something about it if they knew what was really going on with somebody. And um, so trying to educate people that instead of saying thank you for your service, mm. hold the door for a vet and say, how are you doing today? Mm. So we're trying to create a culture of asking someone how they're doing as a way of thanking them for their service. They might not have been spoken to in months. I, um, I used to work with a few um, social workers when I started doing a little bit of investigative work about what I was going to do for, um, for Mallory's Army and the Foundation. and. One of the um, therapists said to me, instead of asking our children, hey, how was your day? Like so casual, ask them, how do you feel today? How do you feel today? You know, um, who did you sit with at lunch? You know, who did you really engage in conversation? Because a lot of times as moms, you know, we just need to check off that list. How was your day today? Good, okay, great, let me get on to dinner. So I think the same thing applies, would be here, is asking, instead of saying, like you said, thank you for your service. How do you feel today? Yeah, you and I, I appreciate you for that. And um, after I watched the film, 
I, as a parent, started going back to some of my parenting techniques and some of the things that I was doing. And he's only four and a half, but those things matter at all ages. And um, I took a lot from you and kind of brought that home and how I, I always encourage my son to express his feelings the best that he can, but sometimes I can tell he has a hard time. He's very proud. And, um, and learning about it early and trying to create that space over time, it doesn't happen overnight, but to make sure he knows he has that space to express himself um, was very important to me. Thanks. And uh, so I appreciate you for that. And, um, and, and for anybody to be able to stand up and, and say how they're feeling is, is a challenge. It is. Um, so, uh, I say children are in transition, and I think this aligns also with the veterans. They're in transition. They're transitioning out of a life where they're told where to eat, what to do. They got their buddies next to them. Their life is very conditioned for them. Um, it's very orderly. Um, they have rules to follow. And the same thing with children. Children are in transition. They're moving into sixth grade, particularly middle school. Their bodies are changing. Their feelings are changing. I tell everyone there's a video um, that we share and it's Mallory and her friend playing dress up. Mm -hmm. And um, I remember that day so clearly because earlier that day she was in her bedroom and the door was locked. Now, now when my children's doors are locked, I panic. And those are all symptoms of PTSD. Mm -hmm. um, I panic when the door is locked. Now it's like we don't lock doors in our house now. Um, but earlier that day, Mallory's door was locked and her, she and her friend were sitting in her bedroom at 12 years old playing with American Girl dolls. Now I always joke and say Mallory would be so upset if I told the world that she was playing with American Girl dolls. So the point of this is, is in the morning, they're playing with dolls because that's the part of their brain that's active. They're still very young and mm -hmm. immature. So she's playing with dolls. And then later that afternoon, she's playing dress up and they're doing a fashion show. And then a little bit later, she's experimenting with makeup. And then she ends her day with stuffed animals. Children are in transition. You know, they're still trying to figure out who mm -hmm. they are going to be. So we throw them into a school system where they are struggling um, academically, they're changing classes, they're managing more personalities than as adults we have to manage. Think about the personalities children have to manage. Mom and dad, teachers, and they can have multiple teachers easily. Then of course they've got soccer coach or gymnastics coach. Friends. Uh, exactly, friends. They could end up managing more than 10 personalities in a one day, whereas you and I, we've got husband, wife, and work and maybe a few friends. We have a, and we have the brain capacity to do it. So it's the same thing, is that when, when you're in transition, you do need a strong support system and you do need to be able to manage those emotions and you are gonna have these ups and highs and lows. And it's important as parents that we learn the issues now before we have them. And so many times parents will come to me and they will say, oh my God, I need your help. And I'm like, but you should have contacted me six months ago. Now that you're in the thick of it, we're trying to unring that bell. Mm -hmm. Whereas if we as parents can start self-education early on with a four-year-old. Um, you know, I was, I was talking to one of my friends, she's a daycare director, and she said that the teachers are so now aware of bullying in their um, classrooms as preschool because of Mallory's story. So two little girls are sitting at the table, they're enjoying some Cheerios, and all of a sudden one girl walks in and she's wearing like the Dora the Explorer light up shoes. Mm -hmm. And the two little girls look over and go, oh my God, look at her shoes. And the teacher instantly catches them and says, whoa, 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 we're not gonna talk like that. They're aware of it because of Mallory's stories, but even as early as preschool, children are oh, yeah. repeating the behavior that they hear at home, at school, online, YouTube, any of those platforms, they're repeating the same behavior. And we have to be aware of that. Well, I think that you bring up a good point and uh, you asked about some aspects of our workshop and that's that our, our leaders are leading by example mm -hmm. and doing the things that we're asking the vets to do during those experiences and during those times that we're together. And, um, and that translates to not just doing it in that space, but doing it at home. Mm -hmm. And for me, when we, I started this, I was very, I, I called, I ran, ran out on the Superman model because I was doing everything uh, from website to phone calls, to organizing, the building, the fundraising, and everything was happening. So I was giving a lot in that space and it was taking away from what was happening at home. Mm -hmm. And um, I needed to find balance and I wasn't balanced. We can't spend more time with the one that died than the ones that are here.
And that was a really tough lesson for me to learn. It's only been two years, but I totally understand that, that you've got to, you've, you've got to say good night to the one mm -hmm. that passed. You, you have to take a break from it, absolutely. And, and I didn't practice that at first, mm -hmm. and uh, I really uh, have been reflecting on that the past couple of years and making the transition to um, be better at that. And kind of even leading with an example for the veterans and telling your story, not to a camera, but to your friend, mm -hmm. or even saying something out loud to yourself is a start to that healing process. Okay, you're having a bad moment, you know, you can do this. It's okay. Do the, do the veterans that have experienced your programs and workshops, do they now volunteer with you? Yeah. Excellent. And, uh, so they are paying it forward. So I wanted to share that with you, yeah. yeah. And uh, as I'm sure people that you've influenced um, through your story are behind you um, in the Army. Yeah. Uh, and we encourage the veterans to come back and volunteer because when they come back, we give them a staff shirt. They're the ones serving the food, setting up the cones, and helping um, with the events. And the vets who are now participating don't realize that that person with the staff shirt on slept in that same dorm, ate in that same chow hall, went to the same recovery programming until they start having the conversation. It's completely priceless to have somebody who has experienced it on the team now and can share, hey, I was in 18, I know what that's like, you know, the coordinator's cool, the food's a bummer, but it's gonna be okay. Right. You know, like, look, I'm here now, I'm doing this, and we're not the answer to everything, and people might not really care about football or what we're doing, but it's a good starting point for a positive choice for yourself. It's a recipe for success.